Right, so I'm the captain of Kit Fox Games, um, and I'm going to tell you about the way that the levels in Shattered Planet are procedurally generated according to design philosophies. So, um, Kit Fox Games is actually made up of four people. Another one is in the audience over there somewhere. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is actually the systems um, developed by Zhang Wu, but also primarily Mike Ditchburn. Um, and he would rather die than be up here talking to you right now. So I'm here to uh, tell you about the procedures that uh, we developed together and the design philosophies that uh, I developed with him. So Shattered Planet uh, came to Steam last July, and it's a science fiction um, dungeon crawler of sorts. Um, it could be called a roguelike by some. And the point to take away here, looking at the screenshot, is that it is procedurally generated tile by tile. So all of the walkable area is generated by an algorithm. There's no hand-built uh, pieces there. And it started, at the beginning, we wanted to make levels that felt like someone had designed them. So we took apart a, a this is a very early mock-up of a level that we were designing, um, and looked at what made it uh, feel like it was designed. And so I'll be going through the procedure that the algorithm actually takes, and why it takes those steps, and then what content design uh, tools and uh, methods that we used, and then what's missing. So the procedure. Um, of the procedural generation uh, begins with the actual geometry. So it builds a shopping list of possible rooms in the dungeon that you can walk along. Um, and that's, you can think of that as analogous to a level designer um, coming up with what the possible minimum and maximum sizes that they can build a given room in. And then it starts placing them out, deciding where doors can be placed. It chooses one as a door, it places another island, it connects the island, and it makes a critical path and it makes side paths. And it understands which is the main and which is the, crit uh, the off the critical path, uh, which will be important later. Um, but at this point, you have basic geometry, and it decays to look a little bit more organic, a little bit more like a shattered planet, and a little less like a dungeon uh, that you would find in, uh, under the ground with a lich in it. Um, and it does that by each individual cell along the edge, um, kind of managing itself, having cellular automata to decide, based on its neighbors, um, its probability of disappearing, um, with possible doors kept as an exception for reasons. Um, the next step is it paints the texture of what it should actually look like to humans. Um, it uses Perlin noise. Um, Mike squashed it until it had a good contrast at the resolution we wanted, which was 5 to 5 or 9 by 9. Um, and then along the seams, it paints a uh, transition texture, which on the right you'll see between 1 and 2. They never actually touch. There's a transition texture put in there uh, where they would have touched. So you get this result of the primary texture, the secondary texture, and a transition texture in between, which is pleasing. Um, one thing that you'll notice here actually is that the bridges uh, never got quite transitioned correctly. They still stick to only one of the primary textures. Um, oh well. <laughs> the, uh, the third thing that it does is it makes it feel even more organic and even more shattered um, by again using cellular automata to have the individual spaces around a given room uh, decide its probability of having what we call crumblies. Um, each edge has that percentage chance to spawn a new crumbly, um, and it inherits the texture of the cell next to it. In the case of a transition texture, it just picks one of the two textures to inherit. Um, we did have to move the islands a bit further away from each other to prevent the illusion that you could walk on these crumblies between islands. Um, but that was the only real adjustment we had to make to the algorithm. And you can see this is before we added the crumblies. Um, it looks very uh, geometric, uh, very rigid. Um, and then adding crumblies and also a, a background texture uh, helps immensely um, with the feeling that you're actually in a level that someone may have designed by hand. So next, um, we have to figure out where to put the obstacles. So we wanted obstacles to make you know, the, the terrain more varied, um, to not let you just walk everywhere you can see. Um, and to do that, we first used a, a depth-first algorithm, a depth-first maze generation. And what you can see it's doing here is any given place that is part of the maze connects to every other place. Right? There is no place in this maze where you will get stuck. You can always move around, even though there's obstacles. Um, and so we used a 
variant of this um, on the map using pathfinding. Um, so the pathfinder would, would decide where obstacles were allowed to go. Uh, we would not do it this way again. I do not recommend it. Um, and it's because this works especially well with rectangles. Um, and as I described before, we don't actually use rectangles. So uh, for example, if you start with the door at the top uh, white section. Um, if you start walking on that path, it no longer connects to a lot of the other paths. Uh, you actually will get stuck uh, almost constantly <laughs> um, using this method. So we had to actually add and duct tape a second system, which would go around and destroy obstacles <laughs> that were placed in the way um, if the pathfinder couldn't find the rest of the, uh, the maze that it had generated. So that was fun. <laughs> um, so next... Uh, I mentioned before that there's a critical path and an off-critical path. Um, the reason why it needed to know that was because although there's different um, entities that could spawn in them, uh, one of these was actually a, a particular kind of entity which would pick a bridge and turn it into an invisible bridge and put a locked door on it and then put a key along the main path. So the, the design tools, we could specify zero to three of these locked doors, and it would segment away one of the side paths and make sure you couldn't get stuck um, and that room could only be accessed through that bridge. And that's important to happen first because the next step was to find where there were dead ends in the level um, and actually loop them around again because as any level designers in the room might know, you shouldn't have players backtracking constantly. Um, so all of the possible doors that we flagged earlier, now look around and see, are there any possible doors kind of near me? If so, I have a 50% chance of connecting to you with an additional bridge. So you end up with a much uh, better flow, a much uh, more fun experience to explore, um, because you're not constantly going out into the tree and then back again, and then out in the side path and back again. So next, the algorithm uh, looks around and says, OK, well, let's put in some enemies, some treasure, some items, some story bits. Um, and it has a similarly built shopping list uh, that I've defined of possible entities. Um, so it's, it puts a certain amount of risk and reward, uh, like little breadcrumbs of treasure, and smaller enemies along the main path, and bigger enemies and bigger treasures along the side paths. And it actually uses the obstacle list here uh, that we generated earlier, remember the, the maze everywhere where it was generating uh, where obstacles were allowed to go? It uses that because enemies are basically obstacles. Um, you have to be able to get through them at some point uh, to get to the end. So that's uh, a reuse there of the algorithm's uh, side system. And finally, after the whole level is built, it's all living, there's enemies and treasure, and you're ready to start playing, um, it splats a big layer of darkness on top. Um, and then the player goes around deleting it as he walks. Um, this simultaneously adds a bit of mystery, uh, making it feel like maybe there's something around the corner that the designer has intended for you. Um, but it also, um, as a, a side benefit, gives the player a sense of where they came from and where they're going, because if they haven't been there yet, then there's, there's darkness in front. Um, and it kind of allows the player to have a self-directed strategic exploration of the space. If they're more of a careful player, they'll use the fog differently than a very bold player or a completionist player. And it was interesting watching the Fog of War specifically uh, to get those cues. So the planet has created itself. Uh, we now have an algorithm that will generate the basic islands. Um, so the problem at that point is, uh, how, what should it actually generate and why? Um, and, it, and that's something the algorithm can't really help us with. Um, as the level designer, a game designer of Kit Fox, um, I look at the tools, and they're just a, a pile of Mad Libs. So I start defining the, the upper bounds and the lower bounds, and I start thinking of themes. Um, like I tell it, okay, this is a, a, a cold room where there's mushrooms, and it can be about this big, and it can have these kinds of things in it. Um, and I hope that the, the algorithm gets it, <laughs> and I uh, play it a little bit. Um, and so this is what kind of what that looks like. This is me defining the uh, primary, secondary transition tiles, um, potential holes in the, uh, the geometry and, and obstacles and things like that. Um, yeah, so 
Another thing, consideration in picking the minimum and maximum sizes um, was actually to think about the theme uh, emotionally of a given level. So if a level is supposed to be very claustrophobic, um, that's more of a defensive level because you have more backing um, when you're fighting enemies. You're not going to get surrounded as much. You can see everything all at once. Uh, smaller rooms are better, whereas uh, we have a place called the Wasteland, uh, which is a much bigger, open, agoraphobic, um, scary place. <laughs> that's uh, better suited to larger uh, numbers and the uh, sizes of the islands. Um, so at some point, we realized that although we wanted to su uh, support various player strategies, uh, there were a few that needed special attention. Um, one was fire. Everybody loved setting things on fire. And uh, we wanted to encourage that. But part of the problem was that there wasn't enough grass everywhere, which was the, the flammable stuff. Um, and so part of it was actually going through methodically and thinking about what are the, exactly all of the strategies that we're supporting, what, how exactly um, are, are the different island themes supporting this. So fire is a strategy that's supported, um, and the various other things. We have to make sure that there are enemies um, and treasure to be found that suit the way that the player is trying to play. And that meant tweaking exactly the content in there. Even if the algorithm itself remained the same, a given level will generate very differently um, depending on what strategy it's trying to encourage. Uh, one special shout out is that we, we had a, uh, an explosion effect that everybody wanted instantly, which was making all of the tiles fall off the face of the earth. It was exploding, the whole, shattering the planet. Um, it's everybody's fantasy, right? Um, <laughs> and then the player would get stuck, and then they weren't as happy. So we added in a little bit of a, a caveat there, that if you exploded part of the level that led to the exit, um, that... Um, May's algorithm I mentioned before would kick in, it would path find between you and the ending, and it would make sure that particular path cannot get blown up, and instead it exposes this dynamically generated um, skeleton of the world, um, which most players don't even understand exactly when it's skeleton and when it's not, um, but it's, a, it, it's not letting you get stranded, basically. So we were pretty proud of ourselves, and we were very happy that the game came out and had you know, 400,000 downloads and whatever, um, but there were some problems, um, and it's, it's very obvious. Uh, it, it became very obvious in the last few months of development. Um, the primary one was actually that a given room had no idea what its purpose was. It had no idea if it was on the main path, if it was on the critical path, if it was a locked room, if it was a boss room. There, was, there was, just wasn't any sense in the algorithm of what a room was at all. It was just geometry that was connected together and painted with a texture and everything I told you about. Um, and that caused a problem because this is actually a screenshot I just took in the game as I was playing. And you can see that the key in the door that was supposed to encourage you know, exploration and risk for reward of go find the key and bring it back to the door and get an, a reward. It, it, it's non-functional because the key is right next to the door. Like, <laughs> why bother? Um, and meanwhile, although this particular example has crystals floating over there, which is very exciting, um, it, half the time uh, there'd be no treasure on the other side, and that's fun too, right? Yeah. Um, so if we could go back in time, we would definitely tell ourselves to build in um, an idea of what each room is doing. Um, another thing that we wished we had done is more of a meta uh, level design um, of difficulty. So we had a ramping difficulty kick in after a certain point, um, and it would add to the it would make it harder and harder and harder. But it really just kind of felt like a bunch of random stuff that was sometimes harder and sometimes easier. Um, whereas a, a a better designed uh, pacing would have peaks of very difficult fights and then let you relax a little bit and then build back up and so forth. And that does not do that. Um, and finally, the, the number one thing that people complained about, they said that it, was, um, it felt a little empty. And to me, I interpreted that as lacking deep consequences. It lacked any rooms that were hand-built. It lacked um, any kind of sense that things were connected. And I think that we as humans, and especially roguelike players, we're suckers for deep patterns. We just love making constellations out of nothing. And, and it really needed to feed just a little, that a little bit more. Um, and so that's what we're building into our next game, which is Moon Hunters. Um, we're building a lot more um, hand-built content and completely redoing the procedural generation. Um, and so now I will take your questions. Thank you.
uh, if we have uh, time for a couple quick questions um, for Tanya before we move on to Dan, and while we're getting Dan's laptop set up, any questions uh, about the about Tanya? Yeah. Uh, So the, the question just to repeat it for everyone was as you're making the move from the procedural to the to the designer uh, uh, the other way around uh, from the feel to yes. the uh, mechanics of the procedural generation um, I mean it, it's it's just part of the process for me um, I feel that that's an important part for every designer to think about like the goal the vision and then break down that down um, into rules and the way that we did that was we actually built a hand built tutorial level and gave it to people and tested it and made sure we liked it. And then once we had something we liked, we analyzed it. And we looked at, okay, well, what are these rules? I was traditionally trained as a level designer, so I knew some of it. Um, but some of it was unique to the game that we couldn't have known before building that prototype because it was, it was specific for that game. So that gave us rules about, like, oh, this is how big that room should be, and this is how long corridors should be, and that kind of thing. And so that helped us build towards uh, code. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, thank you very much, Tanya. Excellent.